today's subject is uh, Row the Boat, Leadership in Midst of Societal Unrest and Political Change. Um, so I thought we'd just tackle something light and airy uh, today in the message. Um, so, you know, why are we here? Why are we here now? What are we to do in the midst of such societal unrest and political change? And I believe that God has a calling for believers and as a church, and that's what I, I want to try to hit today. Um, I've learned through extensive experience in working with people and organizations that there are, there are three types of people. Um, there's people who, ro who rock the boat, there's people who ride in the boat, and there's people who row a boat. And why the analogy might break down at times, I want to kind of help walk you through this idea of rowing the boat and rocking the boat and riding the boat. Because I think our call is to row more, rock less, and ride peaceably. And that's what I hope to get to today. By rock the boat, I mean critical complainers, naysayers, just generally cantankerous people. Um, that when things are going good, they're kind of quiet and off to themselves. But when things aren't going well, they're the first to point fingers, offer criticism. Their criticism becomes louder and louder and more pronounced. And to the, to the, in, to the impact, I think, that even the organization doesn't have as much trouble as they think it has. Rock the boat people generally don't work well with others. They do what they do for a personal uh, market share, just to gain personal followers. They try to gather a group of people who agree with them so they don't look like they're standing alone and that the group somehow validates their leadership. Now, make no mistake that rock the boat people are leaders. Unfortunately, the group isn't concerned about the organization. Um, they're much more concerned about themselves. Rock the boat people do create movement, but that movement is side to side and up and down, not forward. And as a sense, rock the boat people lead, lead sideways, making the ride in the boat people sick and the row in the boat people harder to row. Now, ride the boat people, this makes up the majority of people, I think, in any boat in any organization, company, country. And the motivations of the ride in the boat group, I think, vary from just wanting to keep our head down um, and uh, not wanting to make any waves, all the way to not even being really aware of anything outside of their circle. And I think ride in the boat people are very easily swayed um, with the loudest and the first kind of point of view they encounter. And here's row the boat people. Row the boat people aren't those that are void of an opinion or somehow blind to the troubles of, a, of an organization or a country or a church or anything. It's just that they see themselves as part of the remedy and not just someone to point out a problem. They're not blind to the deficiencies of the people around them, but they just live, decide to live in a proactive manner and not in a negative manner. Um, row the boat people are leaders just like rock the boat people, but row the boat people move forward an organization or a country. And their leadership doesn't end with speech around the water cooler or an act of defiance of, or civil disobedience, but it ends up in an action. Now, to make this um, stir the pot a little more, because I know probably you're running in your mind, how would you classify yourself? Row the boat, rock the boat, ride the boat. And here's the fact of the matter. I've been all three. I've been all three. You pick a situation in my life and put me in it, and I'll be able to tell you, well, yeah, I was just kind of going along to get along. Or I can tell you that, yeah, I was real positive. I was in the group. I was moving it forward ways and not creating any kind of positive movement. And here's the problem, that although I think there is a bent, we each probably carry a bent in between the row of the boat, ride the boat, rock the boat people, in essence, we get in situations and we might fluctuate to go, you know, go one way or the other. But how many of you know that we're in a country right now and a societal unrest and such political change that we need more row the boat people? We're, we're, what we're dealing with here is we're dealing with leadership issues. And it's not so much that you can point to some leader in the church or some leader in the country or some leader in the county or some leader at school and dump all of that stuff on them. Because each of us, we have a call of God as Christians and as followers of Christ, as, as a church, to row more, rock less, and ride peacefully. And the mantle rests on all of us. To say that society is in turmoil is an understatement. There is as much civil and global unrest right now that the most I've seen in my lifetime. But history tells us that it is not unprecedented. 
It's just maybe unprecedented with us. And I think everything rises and falls on leadership. Now, Jesus, in, in, in Matthew chapter 5, he goes through what's been called the Beatitudes. He opens the chapter saying, you know, blessed are those who? You know, blessed are the poor in spirit, and blessed are the meek, and blessed are the peacemakers. And then he comes through that, which basically describes, in my opinion, it describes what it means to live in the kingdom and to become a kingdom person. Okay? He, he's kind of outlining how we get shaped to be kingdom people. Then he goes into a, a passage of scripture, and if you've been to church three times in your lifetime, you've heard some reference to salt and light. But what, I, I, what I'm asking you to do is not default to just a, a, a different way of thinking about it and just hear it with fresh ears this morning. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You're the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So, so hear the salt and light message in light of the context of societal unrest and political change, that we're still called to be salt and light as a church and as believers. When he says, how can salt lose its saltiness, and when it's done with its primary purpose, it just gets thrown underfoot, that salt, um, when it becomes diluted in, the, in this culture specifically, and it was no good for per, pre, uh, preservation. See, salt's main purpose in that time, that culture, it was used for a lot of things, but its main purpose was for, for preservation. It would preserve meat. All right? And so when it, when, it, when it lost its ability to do preserving, then it was thrown out on the roof of the homes, and then it got mixed in with whatever you know, dirt and dust up, up on the roof and whatever still salt qualities it had. Then it hardened and filled in cracks. So it was still, it was still useful, but when his Scripture says it would just be trampled underfoot, what Jesus is saying is, well, that may be a use of the salt, but it's not its primary use. Its primary use is to do preserving. And so when, when he talks about us being the salt of the world, then the question that I ask myself and as an as a individual and as a pastor of this body, the question I'm asking you to ask yourself is, are you operating as salt in societal unrest and in this political change? Are we truly bringing a preserving quality that we're called to do? Are we bringing that preserving quality or if we're not, then we might be feeling a crack or two here or there, but that's not our primary purpose. You've heard the phrase, maybe, maybe not, maybe it's a sign of my age, but someone's not worth their salt. Well, even soldiers would have been paid in salt. They had a great value, and if someone didn't ma measure the value of what the salt, the, the, the expression, you're not worth your salt. The question I continually ask myself in all of this is, am I worth my salt? And then he couples the idea of light. A light of the world can't be hidden. All right, and the, the very fact that salt and light have an impact on what they're you know, put into. Like a light will have an impact on darkness. You can't, there's only one way to keep light from having an impact on darkness. And that's when light is hidden. It didn't even say extinguish. It's saying hidden, that we are a light. And the only way the light doesn't have impact on darkness, I would say in two ways. One is it's not in proximity to darkness, or one if it's covered. And so our call, I believe, as followers of Christ and as the body of Christ, is that we are to be salt and light in this societal unrest and this political change. That we're to be in the middle of it, but bringing, bringing a preserving and truthful kind of context to it. Salt and light Neither are self-serving. Salt doesn't serve itself. Light doesn't serve itself. Boat rowers don't row the boat for personal gain or recognition, but a lot of times boat rockers do. Now, let's talk a little bit about boat riders before I get into that. For whatever reason, there's always a group of people who want to get along to go along to get along. They just don't know what to say, so they just kind of keep their heads down. And I think this is the largest category of people in our country. It's perceived, the rider is perceived to be a safe place in the boat. That if I just, just kind of keep my head down, 
All this is going to bypass me. And, and when I think about the times that I ride in an organization or a church or ride in the boat, here's some of my fears. I'm being afraid of being criticized. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid that I think that if I can just keep quiet and keep my head down, I won't make any enemies. Um, that maybe if I keep quiet and keep down, then, then um, I can't be held responsible for how things turn out. I'm afraid of failing. And the only posture and the only context that I've seen this work is in Survivor. You know, it's the person who leads first and leads the loudest usually gets voted off first. People kind of keep their head down and ride for a period of time. And that's the only context that I see it actually having any kind of, any kind of merit. It's tougher to just ride these days. Have you found that? Because each side keeps pushing in whatever context we're talking about. Each side pushes you to be on one side or the other. And my advice for boat riders is stop allowing someone else to define the discussion. Media is very quick to try to draw out narratives and make you fit in one narrative and the other. But I'm telling you, the closer I look at stuff, I don't see much stuff in black and white anymore. There may be some truth to the narratives. There may not be truth in narratives. But our call as salt and light is not just to get sucked into the, the undertow of the loudest person in the room. The loudest person at your company. The loudest person in our country. Salt and light don't get just sucked up into somebody else's narrative. Know, know, know what's going on. Be informed. Proverbs 18, 17 says this. In a lawsuit, the first to speak seems right until someone comes forward and, and cross-examines. We should be the cross-examiners. We should be the calm voice in the room. I'm telling you what, I mean, I haven't heard more name calling since I was in grade school. And I guess if it's more than one syllable, it's, it's okay. You know, and if you're using big words to call someone something, then it's okay. Do you see how getting caught into that narrative, even that political narrative, doesn't, it doesn't help anybody. It doesn't move anything forward at all. It's riding and rocking. There ain't no rowing to it. I almost feel like now opinion don't, doesn't matter. Actions do. If an opinion can turn into a conviction and I, and I operate from a conviction, that's great. I'll tell you, when I've operated from an opinion, I usually get my hand slapped. But when I operate from a conviction, things get done. The first question I think we have to answer in any situation is, am I responding as salt and light? Am I responding as salt and light? Because I know it can feel like there's nothing we can do when something happens in another state or when we're talking about something as large as a political campaign. But, but, but I believe that when I operate as salt and light in my context, that will inevitably have an impact further down the road. I can't, there's a lot of circumstances and situations I can't touch. So what is my call? To touch what I can. To touch where I am. To not just ride through a conversation or ride through this or ride through that or not just add my critical voice to a host of other critical voices. Where is the salt and light in the context I'm in? And I believe that's our call. Let's talk a little bit about. Well, I believe part of the problem with leadership is we've lost trust in leadership. And in any context, when you lose trust in leadership, Things go, things go badly. Because when you lose trust in leadership, then, then you read one thing and hear one thing, and it may, it may be said, it may not be said, and it may be right, it may not be right. And I think really what we're going through in a country is a very large breach of trust in leadership. And it might not seem like there's anything that we can do with that. So that my context came down to, what can I do with my leadership? Can I be trusted in leadership? Boat rockers. The, those who have been closest to me in leadership over the 10 and 20 years, some people have been, I've been around for 20 years in this room, um, they understand that I don't like to be brought a, pro, brought a problem without a corresponding solution. Um, and so the ones who know me closely, they think through something before they come sit down and talk to me about it. And they say, why? Have you just created a culture that you don't want anybody to disagree with you? No, believe me, that culture does not exist around here. Plenty of disagreement goes on. 
But do we need more opinions and more people to put up problems, or do we need more people to, to assess the situation and offer a solution? See, bringing a leader a suggestion, really all that means is I need you to do something else. And that, like, somehow you're devoid of, of the whole situation. It's someone else's issue to solve. You're riding. They're, you know, they're, they're the captain. They need to take care of it. So here's my suggestion. And then you give a suggestion and you walk up. There's a lot of people in our country mouthing off on suggestions. Not a lot, not a lot of leadership. I don't think, um, uh, well, I, I think boat rockers have a great potential to be boat rowers if they would see things that, see things as if it's not all about them. And, and look, how would our country change? And how would any context that you're in change if there was more humble people in positions of authority? More humility. If more humble people stepped up as leaders. See, humble people don't think less of themselves. Humble people think of themselves less often. So you don't have to be a woe is me, you know, I'm, I'm really not much, I don't have a whole lot to offer here, but you know, maybe you should, cons maybe we can consider. No, it's just, I, I think humble leaders still see that they're leading something, that there's still something bigger than they are. And so whatever goes in context for that, that's, that's what, they're, what they're for. How would things change if you were a more humble leader? How would things change if I was a more humble leader? Everything rises and falls on leadership. It's not that our country needs less people pointing out what's wrong. It's that we need more people acting justly and reacting justly when they're confronted with something. You see, it's not that somehow if we eliminate all the complainers, everything's better. I don't want you to hear me say that. That's not what I'm saying. But it's, it's not that justice will magically appear in our country if there's less people saying how injustice it is. But I think justice does start to disappear if each of us act justly in any situation we find ourselves in that it's not just. I, I can't impact what goes on over here or over here, but I can impact every single day what I'm inserted into, what the arena in which God places me. And if I'm in that situation, I get three choices. I can stand and complain. I can keep my head down and let something go on. Or I can be salt and light. And it, I, I think the issue isn't necessarily we don't have good people. It's just that too many good people are silent. There's too much inactivity. And the church, has we've been put here as a preserving agent and as a light that there is something larger, that there is an answer in Christ, that our issue isn't bad political choices. Our issue is sin. And there's only been one person with the experience enough to defeat it. And that was Jesus. So I ain't looking for Jesus wearing a donkey or an elephant or an independent thing. It ain't going to happen. Jesus ain't there. But am I going to row this thing or am I going to let it run over me? Context is everything. And if you don't believe that your context matters, you are, you are missing your call as salt and light. If our church, if we don't believe that our context matters, we're missing our call as salt and light. This week, interesting example. I'm showing up early at a chiropractic meeting, 7.30 on Friday morning. And I'm in the room, and the room's got four or five people in it already. The, the doctor comes out. He kind of looks around the room, and he says, okay, well, since there's two pastors in the room, I get, there was another guy who was a pastor in there, I guess. And um, he says, since i got two pastors in the room, I'm going to put you to work this morning. And they said, uh, you, know, her, you know, Terry, you, you, everyone knows Terry's, Terry's issue. Well, I'm like, no, I don't. Who's Terry? You know, I'm like, who's Terry? Well, Terry was a receptionist. And so Terry comes out, and, and I'm, I'm like, okay, I'm going to be asked to do something. I have no knowledge of what's going on here, right? And he's saying, so, so, Charlie, you don't know? To, okay, well, Terry has an operable cancer. This is a young woman. And I uh, said, so, so since, you know, this morning, I just feel compelled. We got two pastors. But I'm assuming everybody else is in the room of believers because, by God, we held hands. So whether that guy I held hands with is coming back next week to his practice, I have no idea. You know, all right, we're joining hands praying. And I, but as I prayed, I could not get past God telling me to anoint her with oil. 
Now, all right, all right, already we're praying in a business context at 7.30 in the morning, all right? But that was the doc's choice, not mine. But I went, no, that, I, that, that can't pop. You can't possibly want me now to walk out to my car and tell everybody to pause and grab my. And what's interesting is on the way there, I saw I had a little bottle of anointing oil in my cup holder. And I must have been there from a couple Sundays ago, and we prayed for the sick. And I went, I even saw it walking into the doctor's office. I saw it sitting there. Why in the world it got my attention? I, could, I know afterwards. So we finished praying, a nice pedestrian prayer, right? She goes back and sit down. Everybody goes about their business, and I sit down. And you, you can't really see where she is. And I'm dealing with, well, well God, did, did you really want me? To, you know, like, like God somehow, right? And you're all, you all know where I'm going, you know. You know, there's something good that you want, you know, he wants to happen, and you start going, well, are you sure? Are you sure it's me? Well, who else am I talking to, right? I mean, it's who else in the room. And so I, I went, and she called me back over. Three times I went over to talk to her. Each time going, she won't, I'll go, I'll sit further away. And she will not possibly call me back over there. And three times she called me back over. So, you know, third time I went, look, very, scripture, it means a lot to me in my life, you know, is, you know, do not be anxious about anything, but in all things, by prayer and petition, make your requests known to God. And the peace of God, it transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And that guards the military. So I go into my preacher mode, you know. My Bible geek mode, you know, just describing what, you know, the guard means and all this stuff. And I just couldn't do it anymore. I said, have you ever been anointed with oil and prayed for? I said, I know you've been prayed for. I know you're a believer based on some interactions. And she said, no. And I said, look, I can't explain this. I, I don't, there's no magic in the oil, but I can't get past, I can't get past. If there are any sick among you, call for the elders of church, and they'll anoint you with oil and prayer, the prayer of faith, and the sick will remain whole. Do you, I got it in my car. Do you mind? No. So I go to my car. Walk inside office, I know her with oil. And as I pray, I feel God telling me to speak life into dead bones. And she, that's when she starts crying. And she said, do you know what cancer I have? I said, no. I have bone cancer. I don't know what God's going to do. <laughs> Here's what I know. When I got back in to get adjusted, I looked at the chiropractor and said, you have a complete understanding that this is a kingdom business, don't you? That this just happens to be your arena and your context that we're in which you are salt and light. And how that's the kingdom of God. That's our call as Christians. That every place you are is just another context, another arena to bring salt and light so that there is hope. Our country keeps losing hope. And you lose hope, you get desperate, you get desperate, you get more critical, and, and everything starts to rise up. Where is the hope going to come from if it doesn't come from the church and it doesn't come from fellow believers? Now, for that one story of me stepping out and anointing someone, well, there's probably five others where I blew it. You understand that. I'm not setting myself up as your example for that, except to say that when you will take your context and act justly in the moment that you are in, things change. Things change. So, I can't see right now. So here's, my, here's some conclusion. This idea of rocking more, or rowing more, rocking less, and riding peacefully. Here, here's some scripture that I think can help us in all those contexts, okay? Because there are going to be some times we just ride. I'm not telling everybody. Hey, listen, the people that are type A personalities, you tell them row a boat, they want, they want six oars, right? But I'm just telling you, sometimes I've got, more things have been accomplished by my pause than my, than my motion. All right, so, so you row the boat, people, you need to be careful. Sometimes grabbing all the oars isn't the answer, all right? You just keep hitting people over the head trying to get it in the water. So I call this measure twice, cut once. This is what I think when you're riding the boat, this scripture ought to be in the forefront of your mind. James 1, 19 and 20. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. God's out to produce righteousness in you and me and in the situation we're in. And when I'm not listening and I got my talking points and I'm blowing through them, Ain't no righteousness is going on in that room. Ain't no justice going on in that room. Quick to listen is saying that I have an empathetic ear. I want to understand. Quick to listen says I want to understand. 
How many fights would be disarmed in our country right now if someone just said, I want to understand? Understanding builds bridges that words never do. I want to understand. That is an empathetic approach to any situation, especially one of injustice. I want to understand. Quick to listen. Slow to speak. You know what slow to speak to me, I think it means? Slow to speak means after I've been quick to listen, I've already started questioning everything that I would have said. And I'm going, wow, I would have been real confident about that speech right before I heard your side. Now I'm not, now my words are going to be much more measured, much more careful, much more humble, because now I'm equipped with information I never once ever thought of before. So to become angry, we have lost the art to have a discussion with anybody that disagrees with us. It is heartbreaking that everything turns into an argument that lines have been drawn so hard, so fast, ditches dug so deep. That even before we get into the conversation, we're saying, no, we're out, we're different, we have different not the church, guys, not followers of Christ. As we have, as Romans 7 said, that we, we offer ourselves up as weapons to righteousness as opposed to offering ourselves up to the flesh. So when we offer ourselves up to God, then not only do we become shaped, but then we're able to help shape. But when I offer myself to my flesh, my anger, my opinion, my bitterness, whatever's causing me to, to blow up or respond or treat someone as less than or inferior to and all that kind of stuff, then, boy, just all, any salt and light opportunities have just been now diluted and thrown out on the top of the roof to be walked all over. If I'm going to ride in the boat, let me ride in it listening. Let me be very careful of what I got to say. And I will not let them anger me. I have found that the louder I am in a conversation, the least in control of it I am. The louder I am in a conversation, the least I have, the least good kind of argument I have to stand on. So do you realize that when someone loses it with you, it's because already in the context of being involved with you, they've realized they haven't have a good leg to stand on? So in other words, the only way out of this conversation is if I call you something or get mad or whatever. Or here's, here's the other for um, this idea of when I want to just rock the boat. I believe that we're called to live in hope and offer hope. When I live in hope and not in fear, I am less lock likely to rock this boat as my first instinct. Fear, a lot of times, is what causes us to rock a boat. Either we're afraid of where it's going or we're afraid we're not in control or we're what fear ends up driving that. But if we'd live in hope and offer hope, I believe we'd move from rocking to rowing. Here, here are just a couple of scriptures. John 17, 15 through 18, Jesus says, My prayer is not that you take them out of the world but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of this world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is your truth. As you sent me into this world, I've sent them into the world. Last, last teachings Jesus gives before the crucifixion. This kind of complete acknowledgement that you guys still live here, but you're not made of the same substance. And you know what? I'm not taking you out of that context. You have to be in that context. I'm sending you. You have, you have a role to play in this context. But we don't play the role empty-handed. Colossians 1.27 says, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mercy, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. All right, so look. If Christ is in you and it is the hope of glory, then that should mean that in any context in which I am in, I have now brought the hope of glory into that context. Do you understand that? If Christ in you is the hope of glory, then each context you find yourself in, you have brought the hope and glory of Christ into that context. Be in the context. 1 Peter 3.15 But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. So that I'm in the context with hope. I'm in the context. 
Now, you have to understand that when you are hopeful in a context that is fearful, hope stands out radically. Are you with me? When you are hopeful in a fearful circumstance, hope stands out radically. And in those contexts, there's going to be somewhere, somehow, someone's going to want to know where that hope comes from. We have to be ready then to give an answer because that's how hope gets transferred. Hope is not just a hat by osmosis. You might be more confident. I remember Gina telling me this one time when we were first planting the church. She says, listen, when you're, when you're not confident, I'm not confident. When you're confident, I'm confident. Okay, so that really works, but if we're going to transfer confidence, we need to transfer the source of our confidence, all right? And for us that row, for, for the rowers in the room and for in whatever context and for the country, I think we need to worry less and pray more. I think we need to worry less and pray more. For, now, this is interesting because for boat rowers, prayer is not what boat rowers think needs to be done, right? Those are the, for the boat riders because boat rowers... We want to do something. And praying, we don't think, is doing something. But I'm going to tell you that prayer is not a passive activity. Because prayer engages God. God's not passive. Therefore, prayer is not a passive activity. Regardless of which side of the aisle you believe will bring positive change in our country, there's only one person power enough to break the power of sin, and that's Jesus. I said this earlier. He's the only one with experience. Our next president matters. I believe that it will impact our day to day, but but the title Savior of the World has already been taken. <laughs> already been filled, slots there, no election for that one. So my hope will always end up resting in that one. I believe I should be informed and there should be a conviction of why I vote and who I vote for. But listen, we can draw a line in this room. There'll be just as many people on the three sides. So, so does that somebody not heard from God then? Is somehow, oh, wait a minute, I hear, and it's interesting, it's never me, right? It's never me that didn't hear from God, that you've never heard from God. All right, so, so I really believe it's because we're not electing the Savior of the world. And, but you should have a reason why you're voting the way you're voting. It shouldn't be because there's been a louder voice, and you got sucked into the context of some other conversation. You ought to know. You ought to vote on your conviction. But, but, but not place your hope in that vote. My hopes in the Savior of the world. Now, this ends up seeming like this is the person I'm going to vote for, so I'm going to vote for him, and I'm not going to get sucked into the argument about it. Listen, I don't can I'm not campaigning for anybody. None of them, at any time of the five or six elections I've been a part of, is worth my time to campaign for. Most arguments aren't going to come because someone challenged your conviction to vote. It's because you're trying to convince someone else that you're right and they're wrong. But somehow they've missed it. Because how could you vote for someone who, that's how it all starts. How could you vote for someone who, now, I'm not saying you don't have discussion. You, you, you follow me? I mean, I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying, wow, really, let's not get sucked into, let's, def, let's define narratives instead of getting sucked into narratives. Out in, the, out in the lobby, you guys, you can come up. I was neglecting, I don't even know what time it is. I don't even know what time it is. Well, I don't know what time it is. I don't know what time it is. Um, <laughs> What time we end the service? This one, huh? You don't know either. What time did it start? What time did the service start? It started at 10. Okay. Oh, I'm, shoot. You guys go back down. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, all right, so, so in the context of, you know, our country, all right, so move out of the justice, unjustice thing that our, our country still is in, but this idea of, of elections and, and things. How, how do we handle ourselves? I, out on the table, I put um, just 40 for this service. So uh, this 40 Days of Prayer for America, Desperate for Change. I don't know the author. I don't get a kickback. I, I, I bought 80 copies for the three services. We're 46, 47 days or something like that outside of the election. Okay? So what if the church's context right now is to really be salt and light in prayer? that we ought to be praying for the direction of our country. Yep, as an American, I get one vote. I'm going to be informed. I'm going to cast my one vote. But in the spirit, I'm greater than one person. Same as the church. And so our country needs more boat rowers. 
I mean, it, it's, not that, it's not that maybe someone is made a mistake and they're not leading well and all that kind of stuff. Look, with all the stuff we're facing, we need more people rowing the boat. Do you agree with me? There's just too much stuff that there's just not enough to get around. One person's rowing a boat. We all need to be rowing this boat. And the way we row the boat as a church and as, as an individual is we pray for the direction of our country. God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. More people praying that prayer. This is just a, a, a guide. It's a tool. It's a devotion. And like I said, there's only, there's only 40. So the rest of you take down the but you don't get out there first, take down the information, get your copy, they're a couple bucks a piece. Let's row more. Let's rock less. And let's ride peaceably together in this boat. When, when, the, when the team was leading worship, when they were working through, um, you know, they do sound check at 7.30, and um, I drive in every morning thinking about worship. I drive in every Sunday morning thinking about uh, the time together with you in those 30 minutes. And I came in here in the morning, and I, I, I sat there, and they, when they sang that second song, There Is No Name Higher, it just brought so much hope to me. And that's how I want to end our time together, singing the song again as a reminder of His name is, is higher. Why don't you stand with me so we can sing?